April 24th, and this is the Art 101C, and we're going to look at American pop art and abstract expressionist art in the United States after World War II. So let's go ahead and do that, and let me share this slide. Any other questions, anyone, while I'm loading this up? Are we going to be looking at Andy Warhol? Yeah, we're going to look at Andy, Andy Warhol. Is That's that, what is I that automatically it? thought of. When you thought of American pop art, that's good. That's he is definitely, I'd say, one of the bigger, more important artists from the uh, post World War II era, and probably, arguably, the big artist that artists still sort of wrestle with as far as the the specter of Andy Warhol looms largely over the art world still. And I guess we'll explain why that is today in this class. And here you can see the art world or the art movements uh, in the late twentieth century. And can you see that okay, Alexis? Can you see this image all right? Yes. All right, so uh, Alexis, tell us what we're, what, what are, how would you define the first few eras uh, from 1945 to say 1960? What are the art, uh, what are the art movements? You just want me to read them? Yeah. <laughs> Existentialism. You can just knock this one out of the park. Existentialism, all right, and then? Abstract Expressionism. All right and pop art. Well, today we're gonna to focus on the latter two. Existentialism is a little more kind of a European, Sartre as a philosopher, and it's very much a sort of a very philosophical base, but more European based. The real American based art forms are the abstract expressionist movement and the pop art movement. So let me contextualize that. So if you recall, Picasso was a really major figure in the 20th century, as big as say Andy Warhol, if not bigger. And he is really the sort of the artist whose visual vocabulary defines the abstract art of the 20th century. We've seen Guernica and how he blends the abstract and the representational. And what happens is after World War II, like I said uh, the other day, the United States becomes a real center of the art world. And the reason why the United States adopts a sort of abstract language of the likes of Andy or the likes of Pablo Picasso is because you have a lot of European immigrants coming to the United States during World War II and afterwards. Why is that, Alexis? Why are there a lot of European immigrants coming to the United States during and after World War II? Um, after World War II. Mm -hmm. No Googling it. Um, I'm not really good with history, so I don't know. <laughs> don't know much about history. All right, Steve, how about you? Why do uh, European immigrants come to the United States during and after World War II? Uh, they're trying to like leave the what happened after World War II because it's kind of like it's kind of in shambles over there. So they're coming for like a better life and trying to have a better future. You hear that great they're word? Coming for, like, shambles. The American dream. Great word, shambles. Yes, they're fleeing the shambles, which is Europe is devastated, and a lot of them were Jewish, and they're fleeing uh, Hitler. You know. Albert Einstein, the famous scientist, you know, equals MC squared. He was Jewish and he was, I think, another example of artists or scientists, philosophers who flee Europe knowing that the specter of the Holocaust is sort of um, there. Um, and so they very much leave Europe seeking sanctuary, seeking refuge in the United States. And as you might expect, they have a profound influence on American artists. And you remember, the United States is a much newer country than a lot of places in the world, especially Europe. And so there is sort of that, the new, the new, the new boy and the new girl on the block, the country that sort of has to still sort of earn its sort of res the respect of the world or, or sort of stake its flag in the cultural domain um, and prove its worth in the sort of context or in the face of what came before in Europe and other parts of the world. So a lot of artwork we're going to see today is very much the United States sort of taking the mantle of the art world and the absence of there being an art world anywhere in Europe because it's in shambles, as Steve said. So one of the big artists that, that American artists are sort of, whose visual vocabulary they're wrestling with is Pablo Picasso. And what, he, they're, what they wrestle with is sort of the abstract language of Pablo Picasso. Here you can see him, Pablo Picasso, uh, painting a woman looking into, into a mirror. And it's very much sort of a blend of abstract and realistic or, or representational, which is another way of saying naturalistic. So it still has one foot in the real world and one foot in the purely abstract world. And here he's tackling what you might call Freudian psychoanalysis with the interest or the subject matter being the subconscious mind versus the conscious mind as a, 
as an analogy to looking into the mirror. Um, when I say conscious mind and subconscious mind, Steve, what do you what does that mean, or what do you think that might mean? Um, like the conscious mind is like what you intentionally and know you're thinking, and subconscious mind is like what's going on behind that. It's not really um, voluntary; it's more of an involuntary thought. Yeah, good. And Freud sort of popularized this way of thinking about psychology, sort of became pop psychology. And the artists um, absolutely sort of wrestle with this sort of Freudian language of subconscious versus conscious. And you can think of the dreams, the dreams we have as subconscious, our sexual desires, our, our sort of emotional reaction to things is more subconscious, as you said, involuntary. Whereas our conscious mind is constantly filtering that stuff and kind of keeping us alive and, and surviving and, and channeling out the stuff that's not really important. But of course you have suppression and you don't want to suppress you know, the dark side of your personality and your desires. You have to sort of find some balance between your sort of shadow self, as they call it, and your sort of conscious mind. And Pablo Picasso here is almost visualizing that dichotomy, that binary, that sort of duality of being of the self as sort of looking into the mirror. And you can think about looking into a mirror is almost like, you know, you, you have, you, you look at yourself and even all, all teenagers probably wrestle with the sort of dilemma of, of who am I in terms of the visual aspects of myself versus the sort of inner world of how we evaluate our own selves. And you might consider the modern update to that would be looking at, into YouTube or having your Instagram personality versus the real you. And as we all know, when you go on Instagram or Facebook, I don't have Instagram, but Facebook, Everyone seems all happy and joyful, maybe not today, but that's sort of like a false veneer. And we all know the reality of life is it's not as sort of constantly vacations and good meals and happy moments. So I think that's an important part of the modern era is we are sort of the individual is more important than the collective, more important than the religion, more important than, you know, the individual is the sacred center of, of modern society. And yet the individual is also as something that's in flux. And we all sort of have to wrestle with the sort of dilemma of reconciling our sort of what it means to be you, what it means to be me, what it means to be a, a happy person, a balanced person, especially in the face of all the kinds of things that we know make modern life modern, like technology, like communication, like having a lot of our creature comforts met, but not necessarily having a, a, a moral compass that tells us what's right or wrong. Each one of us has this burden of deciding um, for ourselves, like what is good, what is bad, and sort of owning it and living according to that, but then having complete freedom to just disregard that at any moment. And it's kind of a, it's, it's not easy to sort of become a church unto yourself, a, a religion unto yourself, which is kind of what you have to do, like become the religion of Steve, the religion of TJ, the religion of Alexis, each one of you sort of has to determine your own sort of sense of up and down and right and left, because we really kind of don't have that superimposed onto us from anywhere else, except maybe perhaps from pop culture. And so we'll see kind of how pop, pop culture becomes almost a modern substitute religion um, with a sort of relatable, uh, a relatability that we see, um, that we, we haven't seen really since the times of religion and not unexpectedly we'll see religion come up in as a sort of analogy for pop culture in a moment. So Pablo Picasso, major figure of the 20th century, influences artists all over the world, including with Fredo Lam, who painted this wonderful Cuban sort of twist on abstract art. You can sort of see the blend of, or the influence of Pablo Picasso, who was with Fredo Lam's mentor. So Pablo Picasso's influence is far and wide, and especially this interest in the female figure and sort of corrupting it or distorting it and reinventing it in an unflattering way. Um, you can see that here in the art of Willem de Kooning, who was, a, like, like we said, a European immigrant from Europe fleeing Hitler. And you could see sort of the Picasso influence on him, this sort of very unflattering portrayal of a woman here. And so we're going to see this blend of abstract and representational, and it will be pushed to an even more, uh, more abstract language of abstract expressionism. So one thing I want you guys to note is what is what are the real parameters of this sort of U.S. American update on abstract art as influence um, with the influence from Europe. So let's take a look at that here. And here's Jackson Pollock painting in 1943. So the war isn't over yet. And this, would you say, Steve, is this more pure abstraction or does this have any basis in the real world? I'd say it's pretty pure abstraction. 
Yeah, and you can imagine how hard it is for a lot of people to sort of extract meaning from this unless you sort of treat color for color's sake or movement for movement's sake or sort of uh, flat surface with kind of quirky shapes as sort of a delightful visual sort of um, mix of, of, of form and color, but without the sort of expected subject matter with a focal point, you know, there's no focal point, there's no depth, there's no real sort of sets of uh, hierarchy even. And yet, if you look at it as sort of inventing, reinventing art in a way that hasn't been seen before, that's, you know, novelty for novelty's sake certainly has some value, right? Just look on Facebook, everyone's always sort of falling in love with the next new thing just because it's new. But also the artists are sort of uh, trying to invent an American abstract language that's worthy of its sort of European uh, legacy or its European roots. And that's because the United States is the new superpower after World War II, because Europe is in shambles. A lot of the world is devastated by war. And so these American artists with, uh, with, with the influence of European immigrants sort of giving them sort of a taste of that abstract language try to invent an American vocabulary. And so let's look at what are the sort of parameters of this new sort of abstract expressionism. Um, Steve, I'll ask you again. What can you tell me about the artwork, uh, can you, especially looking here on the left? What is, what is notable uh, from the photograph there about this artwork? It's, it kind of looks like you just took a like dripping paintbrush and just swirled it around and let the paint drip everywhere. Yeah, it's and just a bunch of lines everywhere. And like yeah, so crossing. dripping paint is a pure abstraction, right? And what about uh, when you look at the photograph, what's something else that we can see from the photograph here on the left that we can't necessarily see just from looking at the painting? Um, like how close people go to look at it. Okay. And then it's outlined in like black. Yeah, but what's something else? What's another aspect of it? How big do we typically think of like a painting? Not nearly that big. Right, so that's really something super important. And you'll see a lot of this in museums today, which is big, big artwork, right? And, you, and it means like taking something small and making it really huge is, it transforms it into something else. Whether it's like taking a Barbie doll and making it a monument is something almost like, there's some artistic value to that. And I think what the Americans really do, the American reinvention of abstract, the abstract language here is scale. America is all about bigger, right? Super size me, king size candy bars. I know there were never king size Snickers bars when I was a kid. Now they're like super size, emperor size. They cost a lot more money. So scale is a big part. Um, and how does scale change an abstract painting? Steve, if you're looking at an abstract, let's say this painting were much smaller. Let's say it was about this big. How would that change the way we sort of absorb or look at this work of art? It would kind of seem like less important, like with the big size, it seems like there's a lot more that you can take in from it unless it's like really small. Yeah, I like the word important. There's almost something self-important, right? By making it really big, you're almost like declaring that you're important, right? Right. And I think that's a big part of it. Sort of the Americans are trying to step up to the plate and offer a sort of artwork that's on par with Europe. And partly the scale relates to sort of understanding that when you blow abstract art up really big, it almost has a life of its own. It has a sort of in, internal sort of uh, rhythm and sensory overload um, that is almost more liberating because it is abstract. Um, it's, it's, it wants to go big and you can go big, but what do you have to do in order to paint this scale, paint something so big? How does the artist apply the paint? What did you say about how it looks like it was applied, Steve? Mm -hmm like with a dripping paintbrush and just like standing from like, a, you put it on the ground and you're standing from above. And there you go, that's exactly, and here's Jackson Pollock with his wife who is another major artist, we'll see her work in a moment. And he's dripping paint, he's listening to jazz, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, and he's painting. And you could see the painting either as a painting but also as a record of his sort of dance around the artwork as he's painting it. What do I mean by that, Steve? What, how is it a record of his dance? Um, cause he like kind of move. it's not really like he stands in one place and does the art, he like moves around it, listening to the music, kind of going with the flow. Yeah, so it's almost like a record of his body, like moving around the canvas. It's a record of the way paint falls onto the canvas. And you might notice is there's, there's an element of spontaneity to it. it is, yeah. or, or even, even it makes him less in control. 
you know, he's not, it's not like he's, the closer you get to the canvas, the paint, and with a paintbrush, it's like you have more will to exert on what you're making. You have more control. And here he's almost relinquishing. He's, he's getting rid of that control. And you can decide for yourself whether or not that has merit, but it certainly has originality, and it certainly has a certain kind of novelty. And it's not totally random. What, what can you say is not totally random, perhaps, about this, Steve? Oh, uh, he can well, he like chooses his colors and he somewhat chooses where everything goes. Yeah, then so that's a really good observation. He's picking colors that are primary colors that are poppy that are really sort of he knows how they sort of relate to our visual perception. And there's a layering of colors, not necessarily to achieve depth, but maybe to achieve some kind of visual sensory experience. And I think you notice when it gets really big scale. I think it's an undeniable sensory experience. Just imagine being a little kid. The little kid version of you would probably appreciate this a little more, not necessarily because kids, you know, just crazy draw with crayons, but because there's something almost just beautiful about color, right? Just color for color's sake. And so that, I think, in order to understand this work, you kind of have to see it as, you know, color for color's sake, uh, movement for movement's sake, but also novelty for novelty's sake, and American artists trying to sort of wrestle with the European influence and create something uniquely American and abstract. And it's called abstract expressionism because it is abstract and it is very expressionistic because it has the sort of individual mark of the artist. You know, it's still spontaneous, right? So it, would you say it's, it's expressionistic or it has an expression quality, expressionistic quality, Steve? Yeah, because it, well, it's, yeah, it's supposed to like draw out some sort of emotion, like see what pops out to you and everyone like takes it differently. Yeah, and even you might think of expression, are. like expressionism kind of refers to the artist kind of, like a photograph isn't expressionism so much, right? A pho photograph is objective, right? So expression comes more from like you know, the subjectivity, right? You're the, the individual expresses him or herself, right? So even though this looks very like, it doesn't require much skill per se, and that's debatable, I mean, I don't think, too, not too debatable, but uh, there's definitely an expressionistic underlying element of expressionism here because it corresponds to the individual artist doing something with his body and the imperfect mark of the human body. Just like Van Gogh has a sort of imprecise sort of mark, it's not mechanical. Here we see a sort of the, the, the impromptu makeshift <laughs> quality of the human body. You follow that, Steve? Yeah. Okay, good. So that's where the word abstract expressionism comes from, the sort of abstraction plus the sort of mark of the artist. And you can see him here, the scaly artwork, his wife here, Lee Krasner, and we'll see her work in a moment. This is a Time Magazine uh, clipping in which he was a sort of major celebrated artist sort of uh, of the United States after World War II. And Time Life Magazine is sort of asking tongue in cheek, is he the greatest living painter of the United States? And I think you can see that either as sort of a on the nose kind of, it, this, the question is exactly what it's asking or somewhat ironically or sarcastically saying, really, is this really the greatest artwork living painter in the United States? And we all know why they're asking that because most people really have a hard time understanding the value of this artwork. And you hear phrases like my, my child could do this. And that is absolutely valid. And, but one way to understand this artwork is to really understand the context and understand the novelty of it and understand that these artists are trying to create a new American language that is on one hand related to what came before, but also a unique reinvention of what came before. And here's some artwork by Lee Krasner here, his wife on the right. And you can see likewise, abstract expressionism. So you might consider in the absence of subject matter, what are some things we might be concerned about instead? Uh, JP, are you there? Hello, JP. All right. You see me? So yeah, if, if there's no subject matter perhaps here, like maybe no, no clear focal point, what other things might we consider in the absence of a subject matter or focal point? What other artistic formal tools do we know about that might be important to consider? Um, color and uh, composition. Yeah, color and composition. You might say, you know, the choice of colors, um, and we won't you don't need to go into which and why here, but color is like in the absence of subject matter, color 
becomes a major concern, maybe movement, but certainly composition. So it's not random. It's not like they're just throwing stuff at the, at the, at the canvas. Well, not, not in this case, but we're, they're making choices about colors. And so even though there's not a real clear sort of reality basis for what we're looking at, there is a slight reference to something, but also color for its own sake, movement for its own sake. And this is something we see a little bit of in Europe before World War II, but really it's the American um, blowing up of scale, the scale becoming so big that it becomes like a century abstract expressionistic experience with the imperfection of the artist sort of, um, and the self-importance of the artist as well, um, contained in paintings like this. And you can see the scale. I mean, I'd really, personally, as an, I, I did a lot of art in college, and I love looking at abstract, abstract expressionist art, partly because it's sort of liberating to go from a really small canvas or a portraiture to something really big in a way because it makes your body really involved. Instead of painting from the wrist or painting from the elbow, I mean mechanically, now you're painting from the shoulder and you're almost involving your whole artwork or your whole body in the artwork, like building something or like uh, working on something big, like almost like engineering space and, and figuring out how to apply paint at such a scale. Um, is there something really fun and more involving about having your whole body um, enlisted to um, fill up space. And as I've gotten older, I'm a little less um, interested in it anymore. I still appreciate it very much, the scale. Um, but I do understand completely why sort of, why it exists, but also why people are somewhat alienated by this art form. It is sort of undeniably absent of some clear subject matter. And yet I would argue that the best way to think about it is sort of, it's using these, you know, these formal tools like color, movement, lines, composition, and sort of trying to find meaning on, its, on those terms and not necessarily on the conventional way of looking at artwork as sort of subject, background, and um, it's sort of a formula that they're rejecting. And that corresponds to what happens in the whole art world and dance world and music world after World War II. For instance, in dance, postmodern art, which is sort of, this is the beginning of postmodernism here, it rejects choreography for the sake of improvisation. It rejects sort of the ballet dancer for the everyday movement of someone just walking down the street. So postmodern art, and we'll get more into this next week, is really about sort of deconstructing all of that which came before World War II, all the sort of institutions, all of the sort of uh, traditions of the art world, and turning it on its head. Here you can see some more of this artwork. And so now we're going to shift to the pop art world. And you really should understand pop art both as a reaction to abstract expressionism and the sort of self-importance of abstract expressionism and making fun of that, but also as a shift to consumer culture as a source of inspiration for art. And why do they do that? Well, let's answer that. So mass media like print, like TV, like consumer goods become a source of inspiration and subject matter for the pop art world. So let's take a look at pop art and what I mean by that. Uh, let's see, uh, the, uh, Abby, Abigail. Yes. Yes, uh-oh. So this is pop art. What would you say about this painting? What references uh, the pop culture or technology or mass media? How does this visually or visualize mass media or visually reference mass media? So what first stands out to me is the primary colors. Okay, good. So we're looking at blue, yellow, yellow, and red. And red. Great observation. That's important because those are very poppy colors. Good. And there's also like the solid lines in contrast to the design in the background, like the foreground and the background. Good. So there's a lot more. It's not random. There's, there's choices the artist is making. Give you contrast, give you specific colors. And I think there's a certain visual appeal to all that, right? Go on. How does it reference uh, pop? How does it reference uh, technology or, or mass media now? Um, this wasn't a picture. This wasn't painted, or it was. It's not like a photograph or anything. It's so it's neither a photograph digitally. nor quite a painting, right? Yeah, it was created digitally. Well, not digitally, but you're on the right no? track because we don't have digital yet. We're oh. computers aren't until the '90s, yeah, and we have maybe early computers like the Abacus. But this okay. is in the 1960s. I didn't have the digital. Oh, okay. This so then my, no, that's no. my fault, not yours. But you're right. You're on the right track. This is like a precursor to digital. So okay. where might you find this kind of dot-based 
color here. Is it, is it, um, have you seen this before? Like, what do you mean? Like the red and the yellow? No, the dots. Oh, the dots? Um, have you ever taken a look at a newspaper really up close at like a picture on the image on the, on the newspaper? Oh, it's like pixelated? Yeah, well, it's not, it's not pixels, but the equivalent, the uh, equivalent of pixels. Um, you might see it's it if you look really, if you look really up close at an image, and you can't quite do it because obviously the computer here doesn't, won't show you, but if you look, the closer you look, and you can actually see it almost like the way the computer is translating it, because the computer does the same thing that we see here. And what's the similarity? What's the similarity between pixels and these dots here? How are they functioning the same way? So it's giving you like a colored background without having like a solid yeah. color. And why don't you need a solid color? Because that would just be, you wouldn't be able to tell the picture anymore. It'd ruin the whole picture. Just kind of. Not quite. Now think about the bottom. Look at, look at the bottom part with the way the colors, uh, the dots are sort of uh, arranged. Why does it, why, what did we do? Why are the dots like that on the bottom? That's all he does is bitch. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there, but okay. <laughs> What, what were you saying, Abigail? <laughs> um, the dots on the bottom. Um, there is it supposed to be like waves. Yeah, but the, notice so the way the, the this is the way ink to, to make print media and give you color, right? The art, the the ink is applied through a machine in dots because that basically fills the page with color without wasting a lot of color because the eye basically blends the colors together, especially in the bottom. What happens when you have blue and red? Makes purple. Right. So oh, when you so those see are blue and red dots. Uh, yeah. So those are oh. blue and red dots that blend together by the eye. So it's not unlike like the painting we saw with pointillism um, or pixels because the computer screen is doing the same thing, right? How is a computer screen similar to this? Um, what are, like the way pixels? How do pixels work? I'm, I mean, I'm probably, I'm just going to guess that they're like a bunch of little dots with probably different primary colors to mm -hmm. create other colors. Right. So a computer, when we use pixels on a computer screen, the same way here, individual primary colors. And when you put them together, the eye blends the colors together, right? Mm -hmm. So when you see pixels, there are dots too. And the more pixels you have per square inch, which is PSI, the more resolution you have but also the better quality, the more fine tuned the color, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a precursor to pixels. It's print pixels, if you will. But more importantly, does this have the imperfect mark of the artist? Like you um, would see perhaps here, which is more imperfect, this or this, as far as the application, one? which is more imperfect? The first one. Right, the, and why? Um, well, I mean, I was comparing the second picture to something a computer made, so. And what's and the difference between the, what you just said, a computer making it versus what? Hand painting. Right, so it's like Van Gogh, his sort of mark, right, versus a, like a photograph, right? So there's sort of the imperfect mark of the artist, and I, by imperfect, I don't mean a value judgment, but rather just sort of the sloppiness. Yeah, not symmetrical. The same way if I handwrite something, it's sloppy, right, versus typing it. And that's really what we're looking at, the difference between handwriting here and typing, right? The, the analogy, right? So the artist here, what is he, what is the artist eliminating? What have we removed from the painting? Um, individualism? Yeah, the individuality of the artist's mark, right? Here, it's, it's not even like an artist made it, it's like a machine made it, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's one, big important sort of flag to plant in the pop art, they're rejecting this sort of self-important abstract expressionism where it's like, oh, the genius artist who has made this sort of almost religious like baffling image of pure color and form. Here, the artist couldn't be more different where they're saying, oh no, a machine made this and it's manufactured and it's reproducible and there's no author and there's no individuality. And it's offering it as, as, as good as what we've as the other artwork. So in addition to it being mechanical and all the things I just said, is this relatable? Is more relatable than this? By any definition you want? Yes. And what is what is arguably more relatable about it, perhaps? Um I mean that first picture just kind of looks like 
there's really nothing. In the second picture, you can like visually see the sun and the clouds. Right, so at least we have subject matter here. So even though there's no artists or individuality, and even though it's maybe not even original because you can reproduce this easily, it's still subject matter, right? What else is relatable about it? Um, and it goes back to what we were saying about pixels earlier. Like the colors? Well, in the, it's more, it's relatable because it's come, to, the, the artist is actually borrowing from what? The earth, like nature? The, no, no, print. It's, he's taking, oh. the artist is taking print media, right? Like newspapers, comic books, and translating that into high art, right? Saying, hey, let me take something from everyday print material and put it, make it big, put it on the wall and offer it as art, right? That's kind of partly what's going on here. Yes. So what's the value of that? How is that relatable to us? Apart from the subject matter, what about the way it's made is relatable in terms of what I just said? Um, like relatable to us in the 21st century or? Or just as something, what, what makes us relate to something? It's not just the subject, but what, what is familiar about this to us? The way it was created. And, it, and that relates to what? The pixels with the newspaper. Right, and, it relates to our everyday yeah. news, like news, oh, it's like a newspaper image, and right? Now it's like the computers, because it looks like right. pixels. So but. think about that. It's a, I think that's, for me, one of the more interesting aspects of this. It's not mm -hmm. so much um, the sort of appreciating it as a sort of uh, kind of originality or whatever, but rather that they're treating relatability. Like we think about relatability in the semester as like, oh, does this painting look like the world we see? Is it naturalistic, right? I relate to something that looks kind of like the world I know, right? That's generally how we've looked at how we relate to things, right, this semester, right? With artwork, agreed? Agreed. <laughs> You're not allowed to disagree. So, so and I think everyone understands what I'm getting at. Like, so we have a relationship with something that's familiar, right? But now instead of it being familiar in terms of resembling the world, only resembling the world, it also is familiar because they're borrowing from a dated everyday language, mechanical print language that we see in newsprint. And of course the contemporary version would be digital, right? So you might say the equivalent of this might be an artist making an Instagram, some, some image that references Instagram, maybe the, the way Instagram is laid out, right? And that's familiar and that's, something valuable, right? Because familiarity has some value to it, at least in terms of getting a connection to you. So what I'm getting at is here, the artists are really, the pop artists reject the abstract expressionist movement because it's a little too out there for them. And they say, well, why not borrow from pop culture and offer that as artwork? So you see that here with Roy Lichtenstein borrowing from comic strips in the 1950s, including the illustrations we saw in the last class and offering it as sort of art to be appreciated on its own merits. And it's not original. It's literally a, a print or a copy of a comic strip, right? A piece of a comic strip. And I think he's even making a, a, a satirical comment on Jackson Pollock, the artist we just saw, with this sort of quote saying, or the thought bubble saying, okay, hot shot, I'm pouring. He's referencing the pouring of paint onto the canvas, but he's sort of offering comic book strip art and the artist has no, like, can you, could you make this, Abby? Um, like with an app, probably. Yeah, and, he, and that's probably, he would say, yeah, and that's how he might have done it if he were alive today, too. And, and he would, a lot of us would say, oh, no, that's not good. But guess what? He sold a lot of paintings. And I think a lot of us would still find this charming. And what, what is appealing about this to us, Abby? Um... I mean, oh, hey, I'm going to hang up and call you guys back because we're about to run out of time. So pick up where we left off, check your email, and I'll uh, send you the invite. Um, I have to go to my other class. Okay, that's fine. We'll, I'll get on okay, someone else's you can, you can call on someone else. All right. Thank you, Abby. Okay.